Yes, sir, your screen is now visible. Okay, fine. Slides are visible, sir, now. Okay, all right. Now, I think we are supposed to discuss about Hello. the hypertension Hello. and aerobic practice. That's the topic as such. Now, hypertension as such is an enigma. The basic issue of hypertension itself is a confusing issue. As far as the circulation is concerned, the circulation above the circulation, information about or the knowledge in the Western science is very a sort of awkward situation. Like it started with the different sorts of the theories. And William Harvey is supposed to be the person who invented the closed circulatory system. Earlier, the concept of the circulation were of different varieties. Historically, it was something like the air getting in and then they didn't know that the same blood which flows through the arteries which come and it comes to the veins and this was invented. The uh, uh, invention of a situation or a fact that the blood in the arteries goes into the veins and the same blood is circulated in the body was invented as late as around 1592 and somewhere in between 1578 to 1617 that's uh, the uh, William Harvey who is attributed, who is given the credit of inventing that closed circuitry system. The, in such a situation the fact is really not noted. The real fact is the closed circulatory system was uh, uh, established and the fact were established in Sushil Samhita much earlier in 5000 BC. When Sushil describes about the Sira, the description of the Sira is Sapta Sira Shatani Bhuvanti Yabhi Idam Shariram Aramaiva Jalaharini Bhi Kedara Ivacha Kudya Bhi Ubas Nihate Anugrushyate Cha Akunchana Prasaranandi Bhi Bishethi Drum Patra Sevani Nam Iva Tasam Pratana Ha Tasam Nabhi Mulam Tasascha Prasaranandi Gurdhum Adhas Tiriyakcha The Siras, the vessels they are of two categories, one which supply the blood to the periphery, uh, that's a Aramaiva Jalaharani Bhi, like a garden which is nourished by the water flowing through the channels, or the uh, other way, the second variety is a Kedara Ivachapurda Bhi, like a water pond which is filled by the channels connected to it. So, that dual flow of the blood and the same flow again circulating around and the function of the blood in form of nourishing tissues with a pulsatile movement akunchana prasadanandi bibhisheshi and with the a fine network of the vessels the tumapatra sevanyanam tasam pratana so that description is perfectly mentioned in the Sushar samhita of course the nabhi mula nabhi is considered as a mula whereas now you consider the heart as the pumping mechanism now that's again not an issue of controversy, uh, not an issue to be con considered as a controversial issue. That's depending upon how you look at the function of the circulatory system. The function of the circulatory system, if you consider only the mechanical functions, like the pumping activity, heart is the major area. Whereas if you consider the nourishing function of the blood, then the abdominal circulation, the mesenteric vascular structure would be considered as a, the major area and hence Sushur had considered as a nabhi. Whenever you draw a circle, there is no question of an absolute starting point in a circle. It could be anything of your convenience. So, circulatory system is a circle and you may start from any point and you may end up at any point. But the shape should be maintained. That's on the point and hence whether you consider Nadhi or the Hridaya as the Mula, that doesn't make much difference. But the point is that description of a closed circulatory system was mentioned in Sushrata 5000 years back, but still Whenever you go into the history, the credit goes to William Harvey. Now, anyway, as far as the circulatory pressure and hypertension is concerned, of course, circulation is known, but a possibility of assessing a circulatory pressure, the pressure of circulation in a living human being without cutting the vessels was identified, that kind of a technique was identified only in 1896. So all that whatever we know about the clinical field of the hypertension or the circulatory pressure is a, or all that knowledge is only after 1896 where a cuff based mercury speaking manometer was invented by an Italian physician uh, called Rivarocchi. Uh, earlier to that 
the only means of measuring the pressure of circulation was by cutting a vessel and connecting it to a manometer, which would be impractical in a clinical situation. In experimental situations, in animals, that kind of a setup could be possible, but the pressure of circulation could be measured clinically only in 1896. And the real correct method, uh, the, we, what we use now as a direct blood pressure measurement with the, that uh, assessment of that sound produced during that pressure and assessing the, as a, the <coughs> systolic and diastolic pressure. That concept came in only in 1905 after Nikolai Korotkov defined the systolic and diastolic pressure and the currently used instruments were coming into picture. So, all that history and all that information about the circulatory hypertension issues is just around 200, uh, uh, 130 or 140 years old. So, uh, less, uh, more than just a half, one and a half a century. That's all the information which we have. So, hypertension is a new disease. So, you may not get the full information, same information of the hypertension in Arabic literature. Though the mechanism or the principle of the circulatory system and maintenance of the circulation was well established. Between 1910 and 1914, physicians made were defining that essential hypertension elevated blood pressure when no other cause could be determined and malignant hypertension, a syndrome of severe hypertension associated with the target organ damage. So, all that clinical consequences of the hypertension were studied and they have come into the practical field only after 1910 and 1914, so much later, and about uh, the clinical information about hypertension also is uh, very minimal. The real picture, or rather a study, a established study, and a standard protocol of uh, considering hypertension and its consequences clinically, and generalizing it, uh, reaching it to the public, and making it as a regular practical field, was only in after 1948, when President Roosevelt of America, uh, he signed a, uh, oh, sorry, after his death, uh, three years after his death due to hypertension, of course, uh, with the Roosevelt's death, he had a hypertension, but uh, initially the cause was not known. Later, the uh, people attributed it to the complications of the hypertension, and after that, President Truman signed that uh, uh, the, the uh, National Act, Heart Act in 1948 and that created a pathway for study of heart diseases and resulted in several studies including the most important is a Framingham heart study. So one of the major milestones in the history of hypertension and <coughs> predicting the risk of the hypertension, factors related to the hypertension, all that information related to the hypertension, uh, it was enriched or rather you have a, a, a rich resources of the hypertension only after 1948, so I'm around 70 or 75 years old. <coughs> so, uh, hypertension is a somewhat a, somewhat a new disease and uh, the risk factors and all that related issue is uh, purely based on statistical analysis, statistics as such. As far as the normal hypertension is concerned, there is again a bit of uh, uh, confusion and uh, evolution, rather the concepts have changed from time to time. The uh, initially the first uh, universal uh, guideline to fix the normal blood pressure was in 1967 or 1970 and then onwards there were different uh, committees or different uh, gu guidelines coming into factor which gave that normal blood pressure, considered as a normal pressure starting with the, the BP initially it was only 105 of diastolic pressure and then 160 by 90 as a normal. Now gradually in 2017 the normal blood pressure is uh, considered to be 130 by 80. Now what is normal, what is abnormal, all this is based upon the statistical analysis. Now the latest is, latest and which is universally accepted, the normal blood pressure categories and blood pressure is a uh, normal at present, in the latest is considered as a, the systolic pressure of less than 120, diastolic pressure of less than 180, uh, sorry, uh, less than 80 millimeters of mercury, which is actually much lower than majority of the people who have. Earlier in the 80s, 1980s, when we were studying rather, 
the, the criteria to decide whether a patient has a blood pressure or not was considered as a anything with above diastolic pressure of above 90 millimeters of mercury was considered as a uh, abnormal which required a, uh, treatment. But uh, now reason for reducing this blood pressure regularly, though it's based upon the statistics, the real fact is other way. The other way is uh, enhancing the market of uh, the antihypertensive drugs. So there is a uh, lot of commercial issues also. We will not go into that controversial issue. But universally at present, 120 by 80 is considered as a, the normal pressure. So if it is between 120 to 129 systolic pressure, and then, but the systolic pressure is less than 80, is just considered as elevated, which doesn't require a treatment, but it's considered as a, a sign of caution. A high blood pressure or hypertension is now considered, at present the criteria is 130 by 139, uh, uh, one, uh, systolic pressure of 132, 139 and 80 to 89 diastolic pressure as such. A very high blood pressure or hypertension stage 2 is when the systolic pressure is more than 140 or higher and the diastolic pressure is 90 or higher. Now this criteria again, if you follow this criteria and if you look at the general population, particularly in India, almost 80% of the people above age of 40 even without any other comorbidity, would have a blood pressure above 140 and 90 around, maybe around that range. And whether they really require treatment or not, whether they really need the medicine or not, is a controversial issue. We will try controversial issue. We will try to make out place at next step. A hypertensive crisis, a real condition where you need to uh, go for immediate intervention, is that when the systolic pressure is more than 180 or the diastolic pressure is more than 120. Now, the hypertension goals, now when you treat a patient of hypertension, what should be the ideal goal? This again, there is a lot of controls, uh, confusion or maybe difference of opinion. The difference of opinion between different uh, uh, these groups, medical groups or medical guideline groups like JMC or uh, American Heart Association or American uh, uh, Serological Association as such, uh, different uh, these associations <coughs> such the again it is about the latest uh, the guideline for your treatment target when you treat a patient of hypertension what should be the target the current is uh, the 140 by 90 is uh, if the patient is uh, below 60 if the patient is above 60 150 by 90 is considered to be a target for a general public where the patient doesn't have any other diseases like diabetes or chronic kidney disease. If the patient has diabetes mellitus or chronic kidney disease, it should be 140 by 90 as per the JMC age criteria. Whereas uh, the uh, American uh, Heart Association, again, the, uh, it's almost the same, 140 by 90 is considered as a, a baseline hypertension for all. This is about the guidelines which are present. But okay, it's quite easy to have the guidelines. The practically, to assess the blood pressure and to fix how much is the blood pressure also is quite difficult. You have multiple factors which can produce the variations. One of the important factors is uh, the blood pressure is never constant. It can increase or reduce due to many causes. It could be one of that very well known factor of uh, the factor which produces the change in the blood pressure is what we call as a white coat window. White coat window is uh, when a person goes to a doctor because of the simple uh, anxiety, his blood pressure may raise. It could also be reduced or increased according to the time of the day, night or uh, the daytime. Or it also can depend upon the other issues like your physical activity, uh, stress components and hence uh, there would be always some range of fluctuation and hence to identify whether the patient is really having a raised pressure or normal, again it requires a lot of uh, issue. The now the guideline is uh, the patient has to be, the blood pressure has to be measured at least on three occasions after having a, at least five minutes of rest and that average of the three recordings after having five minutes of rest by the patient is to be considered as a the blood pressure of that patient and that should be the benchmark to start with the treatment. Now again the blood pressure also would be varying according to the location where you measure the pressure. 
the pressure in the aorta is always higher than the arteries artery levels when it comes to the periphery it comes to very low and in the venous side it's only not just 14 millimeters of mercury so when you record the blood pressure again the location the point where you tie the cuff also is one of the factor by which you can decide the pressure now hence the standard protocol is tie the cuff in the uh, forearm uh, sorry in the arm asset uh, with the typical uh, standard tourniquet but now at present you have plenty of options plenty of instruments different varieties of the instruments which can record the blood pressure not the same sp uh, spigma manometer with the cuff and mercury instead now you have many electronic instruments which could be placed on the tip of the finger which could be placed on the wrist and so on the blood pressure recorded in these instruments also have to be corrected or maybe uh, standardized it's not the same blood pressure which need to be considered so it depends upon the normal blood pressure also will depend upon the type of the instrument which you use all that whatever we have discussed as a normal blood pressure it relates to the instrument standard instrument where you tie the cuff in the arm and then use a inflatable cuff at that area and record the blood pressure with a external manometer when you use a electronic instrument which is much more sensitive that, than that or if you use an in instrument which functions in a different mechanism, technological innovations of different sorts, then again the blood pressure has to be standardized according to that. So that, that has to be considered. So that's one of the confusing area and one of the misleading points related to the blood pressure in the clinical practice. Now the other part, the theory part as such, is that the factors which regulate the blood pressure. There are many uh, physiological factors which are regulating the uh, blood pressure, which are quite important in the regulation of the blood pressure. Among them, quite important, even the pharmacological point of view, as well as from the practical clinical point of view, the major three important factors which, reduce, which regulate the blood pressure is uh, the central regulation mechanism. Central regulation mechanism under the control of uh, the brain centers, different brain centers, either cardioregulatory center, vasomotor center, or maybe the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is chemoreceptors from the <coughs> aortic bodies, carotid bodies also. Uh, that, that's the, the uh, one. And sympathetic and parasympathetic system together, they maintain the circulatory pressure based upon the physiological need. Like if any one organ requires more blood for any reason, like when you consume more food, your stomach needs more blood flow. So naturally, flow to the uh, stomach has to be increased at the cost of the blood flow to the other organ. When you do some exercise, the more blood is needed to the muscles than the other organ. So this kind of a preferential shift of the blood pressure is possible by these complex mechanism of sympathetic and parasympathetic system, which will meet the need of the uh, different organs for their normal function. Now, this also is a factor which can produce the variation in the recording of the blood pressure. Another important mechanism is maintaining the total volume of the circulating fluid. So, uh, another factor is the total circulatory volume, which is one of the responsible factors for the maintenance of the blood pressure. And that circulatory volume is maintained by renin angiotensin mechanism, where the kidney has a role to play. The, it produces a constriction of the blood vessels, the resistance of the blood vessels, peripheral resistance of the blood vessels is a factor. When the blood vessels diameter becomes constricted, the pressure increases. And as the pressure increases, amount of the blood reaching to the tissue would be higher. So that's how it has to be maintained. So this is again an intrinsic regulatory mechanism in the body, which keeps the normal physiological functions as such. And when it goes abnormal, then naturally it can produce abnormal, uh, these, uh, uh, abnormal blood pressure conditions. Another important mechanism is ADH mechanism, where antidiuretic hormone, which retains the water in the body, and so that the total volume of the circulation fluid would be increased. And as the volume is in increased, pressure is increased. If the volume reduces, the pressure reduces. As in case of the previous one, like uh, the peripheral resistance, if the blood vessel's diameter is increased, pressure reduces. If the diameter of the blood, blood, blood vessel reduces, then the pressure increases. So now, these phenomena are also used in the pharmacological prescriptions also. You may have vasodilator drugs, drugs which increase the dilatation, uh, diameter of the blood vessels, they will reduce, increase the, reduce the blood pressure. 
if the uh, antidiuretic hormone <coughs> is suppressed, that will again reduce the blood pressure. The central mechanism, if they are manipulated, that if you give a anti sympathetic or uh, sympathetic drugs, drugs which will reduce the sympathetic activity, the blood pressure will reduce, so on and so forth. So I will not go into much of the detail. Now all these complex mechanisms are simplified and maintained, mentioned with a single word in Ashtanga Sangraha and Ashtanga Zaya. In Ashtanga Sangraha, the word used is Dhamani Dharana, which is considered to be a function of the Pranavayu. Pranavayu, the central mechanisms, Pranaha, Murdhi Amastitaha, Kanta Gurashtaraha, Buddhi Hridaya Indriya, Mano Dhamani Dharana, Dhamani Dharana, maintenance of that circulatory structures, the vessels, is one of the important functions of the Pranavayu as mentioned in Ashtanga Sangraha. Whereas in the Ashtanga the uh, function of distribution of the blood vessels in the periphery is attributed to Vyanavata. So Vyanayana Rasadhartha Vahi, Vikshe Pochita Karma, that Vikshe Pochita Karma. Now you may go into more detail in terms of the different mechanisms like renin angiotensin mechanisms or ADH mechanisms which regulate that total amount of the blood reaching to the tissues as per the requirement of the tissue. Either central mechanisms, as in case of the main baron of the pranavai, the peripheral mechanisms, they are part of these uh, functions mentioned in uh, Ayurveda. Though Ayurvedic texts do not describe it in a statistical basis, like so much is the pressure, objective pressure, because it is not possible, because in Sushudar Charaka's time, <coughs> such an instrument was never invented. So all that clinical assessment of the functions of Dhamani Dharana or the Vishayapit Prakarma of Vyana would be based upon the clinical entities which are mentioned in the Samhitas. Now that's about the basic uh, background about the uh, circulatory pressure and its uh, real factors which produce the variation. Now why the hypertension is important from the clinical point of view? The, uh, it's all based upon the statistical observation like patients who are categorized as hypertensive, they have different complications. And these complications which are based upon the statistical observation of large number of population is uh, maybe the one is the life expectancy in hypertensive is considered to be lesser than those who have a normal blood pressure. Now patient, persons who have normal blood pressure, the life expectancy uh, whereas the patient person who have a very significant hypertension, the life expectancy is seen. And again in the life expectancy in such patients, the risk of a, uh, the cardiovascular diseases, the risk of myocardial infarction or lift of, uh, risk of stroke would be more uh, compared to the normal. In a normal, you know, the interesting issue, same is, the, in the normal person too, the risks are there and the life expectancy, anyone would have a limited life. But the life expectancy in a patient of hypertension is shorter and the risk of developing uh, cardiac disorder, mainly coronary vascular disorders or myocardial infarctions or stroke, they are higher in the patients with the hypertension, both in male and the female. Now these are based upon the statistical analysis and uh, uh, references there by a uh, large number of population, men and women uh, studied uh, in by a large population asset. Another of the major complication of the hypertension is a damage to the different organs of the body. Particularly, it could be the cardiovascular complication or it could be retinopathy damage to the eyes or it could be kidney damage which results in a high creatinine levels or it could be the complication like a proteinuria or there could be neurodeficiencies, different sorts of coronal, these cerebrovascular accidents or the thrombosis, embolism, or maybe the hemorrhages, any of that uh, central nervous system complications tend to occur. And hence, hypertension is important from that point of view. Hypertension by itself doesn't produce a disease. It's not a disease, it's a, a silent issue which can produce the different complications as such. The abnormalities of the heart could be either it could be an abnormality of the movement of the heart muscles or it could be coronary vascular disorders which are now studied and the relationship is established based upon the statistical issues. Cardiovascular mortality, the complications produced due to the blood pressure is considered to be the most important issue, the most significant related issue. So whenever a patient has hypertension, 
the major target would be to protect the heart and prevent the cardiovascular mortality. Uh, and uh, the uh, it's again statistically issue is uh, if the pre blood pressure is normal 120 by 80, the risk of cardiovascular mortality varies one. If the patient has a stage two hypertension, that's where the circulated pressure is more than 160 or 180, then it the risk doubles. The risk of cardiovascular pressure doubles. The fact which you have to keep in mind is even if the blood pressure is normal, still the any, any living being would have a risk of developing a cardiovascular complication. Mortality could be there. But hypertension increases it and in a high stage of blood pressure, it almost doubles, the risk doubles. That is the important point. Other coronary risk factors, of course, other complications of coronary risk factors uh, would also be increased due to the hypertension. But it is not only the hypertension alone which increases the risk factors of coronary mass fatality. If the patient has abnormal cholesterol level, the high density levels, smoking high density lipid levels, smoking present or absence, diabetes and uh, the other uh, patient uh, who have left ventricular hypertrophic conditions, so the abnormalities of the ventricular functions, they too have the risk factors. So when a patient comes to you with the coronary pathology, cardiac pathology, generally the first preference is to attribute the patient that cause to be to, as a hypertension. But you will have plenty of other normal pressure conditions where you may have to identify any of these causes and hence uh, authentically whether hypertension alone is responsible for the cardiac pathology or not is again an issue of controversy but universally it is accepted and it is uh, seen that if you maintain the circulatory pressure at a lower uh, comparatively model, uh, moderate level the complications could be reduced. But again, then you have the other controversy. If you reduce it too much, again, the risk could be increased. I will come to that part later. Now, as far as the causes of the hypertension, again, the lot of theories are there. And uh, uh, the issue is again still confusing issue. It is not yet proved. One of the uh, very old theory, and uh, which has still some ongoing changes, are abnormal lipid levels of the body. Uh, consumption of the lipids, abnormal lipids and the relationship of the lipids levels in the body as a cause of hypertension was uh, one of the most important theories and this theory has taken a huge turnovers like changes like and the theory started with the, in 1910 the theory was uh, the atherosclerosis is triggered by the dyslipidemia and it produces uh, the increase in the peripheral vascular resistance and hence the blood pressure would occur. Then the different evolutions were there. So there would be initially up to around 1953 cholesterol was considered to be the culprit. But later on the shift has changed and the later the present issue is giving importance to the low density lipids. Low density lipid as considered as a risk factor for uh, ischemic or coronary heart diseases in 1955 and from then onwards the concepts have changed and uh, the present issue is about the statins being used. So statins are re regularly used as a treatment for this uh, uh, lipidemia, abnormal lipid levels and it has become a fashion almost 70% uh, of the people above the age of 50 who have visited a cardiologist any one time would be taking statins regularly asset. So, statin market now of course the other as view is about the commercial interest. The statin market has increased. Earlier clofibrate was one of the drugs which were used and when the market had increased uh, or the market value of clofibrate and clofibrate producing companies were more in the earlier days. Later it shifted to statin and so on. So, I will not go into that controversial issue. But to those who are interested, they may go into these literatures also, such literatures are available. But the theory about the cause of hypertension related to the abnormal lipid level is a continuously changing asset. Another quite important theory is a stress as a cause of hypertension. The stress as a cause of hypertension, again, it could be either behavioral stress or it could be emotional stress or it could be physiological stress, which are the causes. Uh, physical stress also could be a cause asset. 
and the theories, the factors which produce this uh, hypertension activity, hypertension uh, as such, due to the stress also is now described well known and it is related to the adrenergic axis, the sympathetic axis acid and adrenergic activity is supposed to be stimulated by the stress and hence the hypertension is a trigger. Then there is another issue of oxidative stress uh, related to the hypertension. Oxidative and now this again has become a fashion. Oxidants are incompletely digested materials now, or uh, metabolized substances. During the metabolism of glucose, you will have many of the intermediary metabolic products and these intermediary metabolic products uh, could be the cause. That is exactly what is considered as the AMA by Ayurvedic concepts. AMA is uh, again same where during the digestion process, there is some abnormal substances produced and uh, um, uh, that is, uh, is a cause and oxidants are really the AMA mentioned in Ayurvedic text as such and it may produce various complications and one of the complications could be that circulatory pressure would increase and it can increase, uh, increase the risk of damage to the brain, heart or the kidney and so on. So all that issues are supposed to be there and the causes for the AMA are again many um, and uh, as Bhagavata says the causes of Ama could be very uh, huge it's not only the Annamala it could be Kodruve Bhivsha Seva Vodan Dhyama Sisambo like abnormal biochemical reactions which we now may name with the different chemical names they also could be producing the Ama as such then another issue is uh, of secondary hypertension secondary hypertension is a uh, Due to some other diseases, diseases of the other organ, the hypertension could occur. <coughs> Primary hypertension or essential hypertension is when the other causes are not known or whether other changes in the organism of the body, organs of the body are not known. Amongst all the patients who are categorized as hypertensive, around 69 percent of the patients are of that category where the real causes are not known. The other, a few of the patients may have abnormal mechanism or abnormality of the adrenal gland, either pheochromocytoma or tumors or maybe so on. And they may have either primary aldosteronism or it could be the tumors of the uh, adrenal gland or patients may have an abnormality of the kidney or it could be like cortisol levels may be abnormal and so on which could be factors and such conditions are considered secondary hypertension. Secondary hypertension, the approach to the treatment would be totally different where you need to target to these uh, primary abnormalities. Whereas the primary hypertension, the whatever we discuss now as the treatment protocol could be about the primary hypertension. The secondary hypertension which requires a totally different sort of approach where each of these organ conditions or each of the organ conditions are to be studied and a definite treatment has to be followed. Now, secondary hypertension also could be re related to the drugs which are consumed. Now, among the list of the drugs, again, from uh, presented by or uh, the list reference, I have put the reference here by the Joint National Committee for Prevention of Blood Pressure uh, Universal Guideline. The drugs listed are estrogen, and one of that attention drawing issues, they give a list of herbal drugs. Now, this kind of a publicity even now exists in India also. This is from the Western countries as such. But in India also, you have some that kind of a, uh, publicity. Some of the uh, doctors, they claim that Ayurvedic medicines or herbal medicines also could be a cause for hypertension. So, uh, that's one of the blame which is presented and uh, we should be careful about it. Now, anyway, that's one part. The others which are known to produce a hypertension are illicit drugs which are used to, like amphetamines, cocaine, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, patients, uh, drugs which are used in psychiatric treatment, steroids, sympathomimetic drugs used for other causes also can be a cause for the hypertension. So whenever you see a patient of hypertension, it's quite important to take the history of the drug intake and many of these drugs, they either have to be stopped or their prescription has to be modified, that's why it's important. Now, we consider the hypertension under two categories. One is essential hypertension where the real causes are not known and maybe certain of the 
persons, that kind of raised blood pressure could be a normal for that person. But certain number of conditions, the blood pressure itself, that raised blood pressure itself, could be producing the complications or damage to the different organs of the body. And those conditions where there is a significant direct damage to the organ of the body due to that increased pressure, it is called as malignant hypertension. And that malignant hypertension can produce the damage to different structures of the body and they could be again huge list of that, a brief list of that could be in the kidneys it may produce a necrosis of the arterioles and there could be the damage to the kidney parenchyma and resulting in a chronic renal failure or kidney injury. Or in the heart it can result in the left ventricular hypertrophy, abnormality of the systolic and diastolic functions or it could be producing a damage to the eyes, one of the important causes, retinopathy, where the retinal blood vessels may be uh, fibrosed or may be even atherosclerosis or even they may rupture, producing the exudates and uh, deposition over the retina, which can produce uh, a vision abnormality. Over the brain, it can produce uh, cerebrovascular accident, which are quite common, different, uh, it could be the cerebral edema. There could be abnormalities in the finer vessels of the body resulting in thrombocytopenia or hemolytic anemia. Abnormalities of the lipid mechanism, now whether it is a cause for the hypertension or whether it is a, a really a effect of the hypertension is not known, but generally these are considered to be the causes for the hypertension to become malignant. Like a patient who have a abnormal ischemia of the kidney or activation of the renin angiotensin mechanism endothelial dysfunctions of the blood vessels where the blood vessels become rigid if the patient has abnormalities of the thrombotic mechanism clot factors as such they are the factors which make a simple hypertension or essential hypertension into malignant convert that so a patient of hypertension you need to identify the possible risk factors in that patient and whenever the, uh, you have to identify maybe a visible or maybe a, a maybe latent organ dimensions of the different organs which need to be assessed from the clinical point of view. Now, as far as the conditions which are described as uh, the important factors which increase the blood pressure, this is from uh, some of the very interesting internet reference, of course, uh, uh, it is not from a standard publication. The number one factor is your doctor. So, many a times the hypertension or the circulatory pressure uh, abnormalities and prescription of the antihypertensives are given unnecessarily. Many times it is created by the physician or his setup, physician setup itself could be the factors. The other factors which are known or which are now established to be the factors established to be the causes of the hypertension or which can produce a hypertension as far as the lifestyle factors are concerned. A extra sugar consumption, a psychological condition produced due to loneliness, sleep conditions, abnormalities of the sleep, improper consumption of the potassium, pain itself, then herbal supplements as I told you the controversial issue, abnormalities of the thyroid gland, a retained urine, drugs like nasal decongestants, dehydration, uh, hormonal birth abnormalities or uh, quarreling, the fighting with some others, antidepressants, these are the other known factors which can produce the change in the blood pressure. The one important is your doctor or a physician himself can be a cause for the hypertension. Now, as far as the treatment protocol is concerned, I am just talking about the standard treatment protocol which is a, a practice and which is given as a guideline universally. The abnormal the treatment protocol is if a person has normal blood pressure, this chart is given by a, a standard guideline, high blood pressure guideline in 2017 which is uh, considered to be the rather latest by the cardiology unit as such. The, and the approach is uh, uh, given as the specific uh, approaches for normal, elevated, stage 1 hypertension and stage 2 hypertension. The more important is uh, in the normal blood pressure approach, the standard protocol guideline, universal guideline, which is mentioned in the standard medical practice is uh, uh, you just don't have to do anything, promote optimal lifestyle habits, advise the patient to have the lifestyle habits which do not increase the blood pressure and continuously monitor, assess the patient once in a year. 
if the blood pressure in the category of 129 to 80, there will be no pharmacological intervention and reassess once in 3 to 6 months. That's what we, is the guideline. No medicine is to be prescribed as per the guideline. Then in a stage 1 hypertension, if you assess clinically and if the patient has a no, uh, very little risk or no risk of uh, the cardiovascular deformity, the car coronary pathologies, then again no medicine is prescribed, no medicine to be prescribed and reassess at 3 to 6 months. It's important if the patient's blood pressure is in between 140 to 90, that 139 to 89, and if the patient doesn't have a abnormality of the coronary vessels or there is a no uh, visible increase in the size of the ventricles, again no medicine is prescribed, it would be only the non-pharmacological non therapy, non-pharmacological therapy is only about the diet and exercise, I will come to that part. If the patient has a coronary pathology, then again the guideline is uh, don't start the medical treatment immediately, don't start with the medicines, reassess the patient once in a month. If the patient still shows that the BP goal is not met, then you may have to uh, give a prescription. If the patient's BP goal is met, just give a monitoring, continuously monitoring. If maybe if you can prescribe the medicines, you may give the prescription. If the stage 2 hypertension, the blood pressure 140 to 90 and above, again, the ideal prescription is not to give a prescription, not give up, no use of medicine unless there is a coronary risk asset. The best not for, now the important is as per the standard guideline, the role of antihypertensive drug is limited to only to those conditions which are malignant hypertension or which are the enhanced hypertensions like stage 2 B above or patients who have a high coronary risk asset or other risk factors, other end organ involvement. So, the, one of the important point which is from the practical clinical point of view is uh, most of the prescriptions of antihypertensive drugs which are prescribed in the country, uh, situation and the patients who are taking these antihypertensive drugs regularly, they are unnecessary, they are against the standard protocol, that's the important point. Now, the most important and uh, well proven non-pharmaceutical interventions where there is no need of blood, uh, these medicines is uh, uh, inducing weight loss and uh, the uh, standard reason if a person uh, is uh, re reducing the weight by 1 kg his blood pressure will reduce by about 5 millimeters of mercury uh, less uh, the one of the important condition if the patient is hypertensive if the patient is normal having normal blood pressure then by reducing the weight by 1 kg, the reduction of the pressure will be by 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury. Then the diet, healthy diet, healthy diet again is a dash diet is a diet against the systemic hypertension. I will come to that part. What are the diets which are suggested universally? And it's a, a diet which is rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains and low fat dairy products with the reduced content of saturated total fat. If that diet is modified, you can reduce the blood pressure in a patient of hypertensive condition by around 11 millimeters of mercury, whereas in a normal tensive person, you can reduce it by around 3 millimeters of mercury. Then, uh, by regulating the sodium, dietary sodium content, salt content in the food, the and the optimal goal is less than one and a half uh, uh, grams per day or 1,005 milligram per day, and uh, or maybe less than that 1,000 milligram per day. You can reduce the blood pressure in a hypertensive patient by around 5 to 6 millimeters of mercury and in a normal person, normal tensive person, 2 to 3 millimeters of mercury. And uh, uh, increasing the dietary potassium, potassium contents, mainly the fruits which contain that potassium, the target is around 3,500 to 5,000 milligram per day by consumption in the form of a diet which are rich in the potassium, not directly potassium salts. You can reduce the blood pressure by around 4 to 5 millimeters of mercury. So, the important is by having these protocols together, all these non pharmacological interventions together, you can reduce the blood pressure by around 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury. And in majority of the patients, more than 90% of the patients, 
if you can reduce the blood pressure by around 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury, that itself would be enough to keep the patient under the normal blood pressure category and the, all that drugs are not necessary. Now, what we call as the DASH or a diet approach again to stop hypertension is again same like the grains, fruits, vegetables, low fat diets and the lean meats uh, which do not have that yellow content and nuts, seeds, fats and sweets as such which is given by the US, US National Institute of Health and the calorie content should be total uh, amount or uh, number of servings would be uh, if the person is around in the calorie category of 1600 to 3100 that's uh, a patient who has uh, depending upon the range of activity you may prescribe that amount of the drug release food as such so that's uh, the one of the important issues. so uh, basically it's about the food particularly the junk food which is uh, stored and preserved or which has more of sugar and more of fat contents, oil and salt contents and sugar contents. These are the major causes. And the foods to avoid that during the hypertension are those the jack fruits which contain excess of sugar, excess of salt, or excess of oily contents. Alcohol, these are meat, also red meat also, is considered to be the diet which has to be avoided by which you can maintain the blood pressure. Now, that's about the contemporary theories of the hypertension. I will not go into the details of the drugs which are used in the contemporary system because uh, our target is about the Ayurvedic prescription. But the issues about the contemporary prescriptions also are important in the other way. I will come to that part. Now, as far as the treatment protocol of uh, hypertensive patients, from Ayurvedic point of view, the perceptions could vary from different person to person and lots of theories are there. What I would consider as hypertension from Ayurvedic point of view Condition, see, it's, it's true that our Samhitas would not mention the hypertension condition directly because at that time that the concept of measuring the blood pressure was not there and whatever we consider our hypertension is purely based upon that measurement and statistical issue. So, absolutely that may not be possible. But the disease was existing and the disease how it could have been perceived, that's the point. So, from my point of view, I would consider the hypertension as a sum of the avrata vata wave abnormalities. What Ashtangarve has said, so now say, after the hypertension is a silent killer. Avrata vatas also are silent killers as per the Ashtangarve. Avrata vayavo ajnata jnata va vapsaram siddhaha prayatne tapidu sadhya prayatne tapidu sadhya bhavehu anupakramaha. Avrata vata for a long time they may remain silent and hence they may not be really identified and in due course of time they may produce an incurable condition. So, I would consider system hypertension as different, particularly symptomatic hypertension as a different Avarna varieties. The major complication of the hypertension is Hrubdroga or the hypertension also would be a triggering factor for the, uh, the changes which are produced in the old age, organ damage particularly Synaptic changes are one of the sequelae of the hypertension, and hence the other way I would consider them as a jarabiyadi. And uh, uh, what uh, Charaka has mentioned is same. Tasma uh, avarana is one of the factors which can trigger the diseases like shukdoga, vitrhikpriha, gulmo, atisara, evaja, vanti upadravati, sham, avatranam, upekshanata, tasma avaranam, vaidya, povana, sivkalakshayata, that end organ complications produced due to negligence of the abnormality avarana may be somewhat comparable to the hypertensive factors. Now that's exactly what we see with the blood pressure. Patients who have the blood pressure would have a renal issue, metabolic issue, vascular issue which can produce the complications of different organs as such. Now coming to the practical field, when the current situation, you will have plenty of patients who would be taking antihypertensive drugs. People are uh, having certain basic knowledge about the blood pressure and particularly with the newer generation that people are quite acquainted with the Google resources, they may be at times, they may become more expert than the doctors and the, uh, even the medical field, total asset medical field is uh, having a very rather high sensitivity to the blood pressure and uh, about the prescriptions of the antihypertensive drugs again, there, most of the times is over prescribed and when a patient comes to an Ayurvedic doctor, 
you will have certain issues which are more significant or maybe specifically significant in the current situation compared to what Charaka or Sushudha have met with. So Charaka or Sushudha or Vagmata, they didn't have a competitor, there, were, there was no such issue of a contemporary system which will be a, you know, producing a change in the perception of the patient. Whereas now the situation is different. So I would be summarizing that in terms of what I see in my practice. The number of patients and variety of the patients, spectrum of patients which I see in my practice. Now this is about the rough percentage, what I have given as the percentage is the rough percentage, maybe slightly there could be variation, it's not very really accurate statistical analysis. When I diagnose the patient, asymptomatic hypertension patient by recording the blood pressure, when I every patient, do, I do record the blood pressure and that during the recording of the blood pressure, if the patient is identified as hypertensive, that's the newly diagnosed primary asymptomatic hypertension condition, which constitutes around 15%. Then patients who are diagnosed as a, uh, diagnosed based upon the symptoms of hypertension, symptomatic hypertension symptoms. Now I will come to that, symptoms of hypertension and then related management is the other issue. I will come to that. Most common symptoms of hypertension are giddiness, uh, abnormal sleep and behavior abnormalities or uh, dyspnea on exertion. These are the most common clinical symptoms of the hypertension which we see, though majority of the patients could be asymptomatic. Now, in such patients who have the symptoms and then they are found to be hypertensive, they are around 15%. So, around 30% of the patients I may diagnose as a hypertensive uh, among the total patients whom I treat for they are who come to me for the hypertension management. Then you will have a good, uh, good number of patients where patients are already on antihypertensive drugs and they have a stable blood pressure but they opt for uh, aerobic treatment, very dangerous patients. These are very dangerous patients. They may not be very consistent with our treatment and uh, for a few days they may follow our treatment, they may go and then there is a risk of getting bad name for that. And uh, in my practice I see around 7% of such patients of hypertensive category. For other practitioners, these percentages may vary depending upon your social perception as such in the practice as such. Then patients who are on antihypertensive drugs, uh, modern drugs, but they are not stabilized. Blood pressure is not really controlled, but they prefer an added treatment either as a supplement or as an alternative. And again, that constitutes around 5%. There you need a lot of clinical skill and all that current literary information has to be known then only can manage the patient successfully. And one of the important protocol would be, or important uh, message of the practice would be, because of your allegiance to a system like Ayurvedic treatment, patients should not be deprived of the facilities or advantages of the contemporary science. And what we should do is should give the best to the patient and should not harm the interests of the patient. And that becomes a very sensitive issue in such categories where the patients who are on antihypertensive drugs and uh, they opt for ayurvedic treatment where the blood pressure is not categorized as or may be stabilized or may be stabilized. Then patients who are on antihypertensive and they have adverse, adverse effects of the drugs that, and they prefer to have an ayurvedic treatment because they cannot tolerate the contemporary system medicine. Patients who come with acute complications like a CBA, coronary ischemia, quite uh, common, which is around 10% in my patients. As patients who have either CBA or coronary artery diseases and they are treated with the modern drugs, stabilize blood pressure, and they opt for an ayurvedic treatment, that comes to another major category, 40% of the patients. Secondary hypertension conditions are hardly around 3%. The important sensitive areas are those patients who are taking the contemporary system of medicine who have some other underlying pathology which could be critical and when they opt for ayurvedic treatment, how to manage, this is one of the most critical issue and this can be effectively managed only when you know absolutely the limitations as well as the plus points of the contemporary system. So I always say that a successful ayurvedic practitioner should be more modern than a modern doctor. So all that modern medicines, their utility should be known and their limitations uh, complications, all that has been known, then only you can manage and that becomes the most sensitive part. Now, my principle of dealing with, considering these issues, that uh, uh, the primary interest of the patient and the contemporary advantages of the contemporary system as well as the disadvantages, 
I have a strategy and based upon my clinical experience, now this may be different, these strategies and approaches may be different from one Arabic practitioner to other, but my prescription and my following of the treatment data, patient who come with an acute end organ involvement like coronary vascular accidents or coronary ischemia or renal pathologies, there is a very limitation for standalone Arabic treatment. I would be making, if the patient is already on any complementary system of medicine, modern medicine, I will be keeping those drugs as such and then along with that maybe we may give a prescription based upon the doshi dushi lakshanas of the patient. But the success, there may not be very huge significant changes except maybe slight change in the quality of the life. So a standalone alveic treatment may not be uh, preferable, I would not prescribe that. Then patients on antihypertensive drugs with the stabilized status, preferably I would not modify, I would not change that. I would advise the patient to continue because they do not have other any adverse effects and they have stabilized blood pressure, it's better to continue with that unless there is a need. But if the patient have uh, are on antihypertensive drugs but not stabilized and with the complications like CBA, I would try to maybe modify the modern prescriptions or change, uh, maintain the existing prescribed and plan the management. Along with that, we may give our uh, treatment as well as the dosha dosha protocol. Now, the major category otherwise would be those patients where the patient would have the symptomatic condition. The one of the major uh, symptoms, common symptoms of a patient of hypertension would be dyspnea and exertion. That's exactly I would consider as a, the udana out of prana. And the udana out of prana would be presenting with the nishwasa, uchhasa samroga, prasishaya shirograha, these are the possible uh, permutation combination of the avatavant. I would be considering the patients of hypertension presenting with the dyspnea as Udana avatavata and my prescription would be usually Chandrapurva, Punarnava Mandara, Avipatikara Churna considering that avata avarana and giving a vata shama kavakshadis uh, with maybe a slightly Mm, uh, modify or maybe uh, the other way, a diuretic drug like Punarma Mandura, a, the mode of prescribing the drugs in case of the hypertension. Uh, the consist responses you have to modify, it cannot be predicted accurately in patients with dyspnea. You need to follow. Some of the patients may respond well, some patients may not respond well. And usually, my treatment protocol is if I identify a patient as a, a pressure hypertensive condition and when there, are, when there are no other risk factors, I would not prescribe any medicine. I would advise the patient to keep the lifestyle, that follow the lifestyle, having that regular, uh, that control in the diet and regular exercises and maybe a regular follow. If the patient shows a positive response of reducing the blood pressure, I would not prescribe any medicine. So prescription of the medicine is only when the patient has a symptoms and that category is if the patient has a dyspnea as a symptom, I would consider it as a udana avatva prana. Then if the patient has a giddiness as a symptom, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the giddiness as a symptom means I would consider as a pitta avatva prana or a pitta avatva udana, where brahma, murcha are the other sim uh, common symptoms which are presented over there. And, uh, uh, in that condition, my prescription would be because of the Pitta Varana, I would be prescribing Chandraprabha, Kamatuka or Bhunimba. And Vivechana in such patients would be very dependable, produces a significant result. In a patient of hypertension with the giddiness as a symptom, my prescription would be Pitta Shamaka treatment like Chandraprabha, Kamatuka, Bhunimba, etc. And the Vivechana, if possible, and depending upon the patient's facilities, that would be my prescription which I would always prefer and it gives more dependable results. Then the patients who have developed the transient ischemic attacks and uritis like symptom, where there could be a slight temporary this impairment of the functions, giddiness and followed by loss of sensations or loss of movements in certain part of the body, temporary transient ischemic attack where the patient has recovered within 24 hours. In such conditions, I would consider this as a pitta or the vyana, where Raho, Vyanyaja Saroga, Klamaha, Anga Chesta, Sangashta, Sasam Tapaha, Sabedanaha. And my prescription would be that Chandra Purva, Ekam Vira, Manjistavi Pata, Arashwagandarishta, depending upon the presentation of the patient. 
the Mata Gusti or Raja Gusti is the other line of the treatment which I would prefer, which gives a more satisfactory result. Then, if the patient presents with the obesity and hypertension or dyslipidemia, abnormalities of the lipid levels, and the patient has hypertension, then I would consider this as Kapha Vrta Gudana or Kapha Vrta Vyana or Kapha Vrta Prana. So, Kapha Vrana as such. And the Kapha Vrta Prana, Gurugatratum, Aruchi, Vaksaragraha, Balavarna Pranasha. That's the typical features which you see in case of a obesity. Or Vyana Vata abnormality, Guruta Angeshu. Sarveshu skharitam dekato, abnormal gait as such and heaviness, which is the typical presentation. Usually main description would be Chandra Prabha, Arogya Jani Avipatikara. Or Agni Chikitsa is one of the treatment which we give in our SGM hospital, where we apply some Dikshna Ushiris over the surface of the body, a check vapor which we name as Agni Chikitsa, which is not really a classical treatment mentioned in Samhita. I will name this as a clinic, but it is a sort of labor, external labor of Tishna Ushadis, uh, where the drugs are collected based upon the folklore uh, practices and it's used and, and it's standardized in SDM hospital would be and we give use in large number of patients. With the Kshanabasti or Matrabasti is the prescription in such patients which gives you satisfactory results. Now patients with the hypertensive encephalopathy. That's I would consider the mass of mala. And that's uh, the exact description present in the text as Edapu, Rattavahini, Rasad, Sanya Mahanicha. Rattat Rattat Samastava, Svotam Sukupita Malaha, Malina Ahara Shilasya, Rajo Mahavrat Manaha, Tadihatya Avadishthante, Jayante, Varesla, Mother Murcha, Ayasa, Sanyasa, Tesham, Vidya, Vijakshanaha. So Mother Murcha Sanyasa could be a complication of who? The Rasabaha Sotas Avarana, that's exactly hypertensive encephalopathy, and that is considered as Asadhya by our Samhitas. Uh, the, this, uh, and that condition, of, of course, is uh, Asadhya. And in such conditions, um, uh, main approach would be blood pressure has to be managed with the established antiprensive drugs. I would not hes hesitate to use the antiprensive drugs. Uh, depending upon the patient's condition, because uh, there the time is a very important factor. So, it, it, it may not be by a standalone identity treatment. So, blood pressure has to be brought back to the normal level. That's exactly the malignant hypertension condition where the patient may have encephalopathy. <coughs> and uh, such conditions, you may need certain of the support, like grave support treatment, like maybe at times it could be uh, rail strip insertion, at times it could be a catheterization, at times it could be ventilation or maybe oxygen support, depending upon the patient's condition. That's an important issue. So it may not be only standalone treatment. Now, once the patient has stabilized and the blood pressure is regulated, main prescription would be usually Chandra Prabha, Ekangvira, Abhraka, Tapyati, Godhantya, and Navipatikara given together. And Agni Chikisa with Matra Basti, which is a very common prescription which is given in patients where the patient may either even have the stroke, it is the same issue. Even the patients who do not have the soap, the treatment is a same issue. That's about the scope of ayurvedic treatment which I prescribe. But there is a very huge another important area where we can produce, ayurvedic treatment can produce a huge change there and there it's about the side effects of the commonly used drugs, the antihypertensive drugs. You will have plenty of patients who are using the antihypertensive drugs. Either the patients are not ready to stop the drugs, but they have the adverse effects or it could be like uh, the, uh, it cannot be stopped due to the other end organ pathologies or other complications. And these are the areas where we can do a huge change. Among them, the my approach to the treatment of these uh, patients coming to with the anti these complications of the antihypertensive drugs, right? The one major group of the drugs are beta blockers. It may produce the bradycardia, hypotension, dizziness, fatigue, depression, diarrhea, etc. Such patients usually when I prescribe Kandar Prabha and Saraswati Shala, that was I am sure. The majority of these complications can be minimized and the patient can have a comfortable life. Then patients who have, are on alpha blocker drugs, like uh, uh, presumption, presumption, uh, such, orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, uh, tachycardia, vertigo, syncope, diarrhea, these are the common conditions. And in these conditions, 
uh, again, it's a chandra prabhak sarasar, it's a, which is usually prescribed. Calcium channel blockers, they also have bradycardia, hypotension, tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, etc. And in these conditions, prabhakaravati and kumari also is the usual prescription which I would prefer. And uh, the Arugavati and Manjistari Kvata also is preferred in the same calcium channel blocker induced at abnormal uh, signal complications. Then AC inhibitors, uh, which are again commonly prescribed, that could be edema in the limb, edema, the, or dry cough, hyperkalemia. In these conditions, usually again Chandrapubank Sarasarishta is uh, one of the drugs which gives satisfactory relief of these adverse effects. So these are the areas where we can produce some changes in the total outcome. Though primary treatment for the hypertension may not be as significant or as huge as that of the contemporary asset. Now as far as the views about uh, hypertension by Ayurvedic experts, whatever I have told is uh, uh, my perception, how I deal with. But lots of other uh, views are there and lots of other names are used. Uh, based upon uh, from the different experts in Ayurveda and they may have given you know, many of these people they may have given Dhamani pra, Prapurana, Rakta Gatavata, Sira Gatavata, Avarta Vata Roga, Bhyana Bala, Dhamani Pratijaya, Rakta Vata, then uh, Ucha Rakta Japa, Rakta Avarta Vata, Prana Avarta Bhyana, Bhyana Avarta Prana, Shleshma Avarta Bhyana, these are all the different uh, perceptions about hyperregion by different experts. Uh, of course all of them they have their own validity, I am not criticizing that. From the our system point of view, uh, our Ayush department, the National Institute, uh, this, uh, uh, National Council of Indian Medicine, and it's, uh, the Ayush department has given a broad uh, literature about uh, hypertension, and there its name, the condition is named as Vyana Bala Vaishamya. Vyana Bala Vaishamya is considered as an hypertension and in its website you find a literature about the blood pressure, certain of the textual factors, ayurvedic textual factors and some of the views of some experts about the hypertension is mentioned and the again I will not go into the detail, those who are interested they can go through the website. The list of the drugs which are mentioned in that context by our Aish system, Aish ministry related issues would be the Mamsiyadupata, Sarpaganga, Brahmivati, Prabhakaravati, Arjunarishta, Abhayarishta, Pravadapishti, Shwetaparpati, Nagarjuna Abhrarasa are the certain and Hrudayaranavarasa are mentioned as the drugs as such and their details and duration is mentioned. Of course, whether these, I am not analyzing, I am not criticizing these facts like, but these are the drugs which are mentioned there in that text. Now, how far these are practically true, how far they produce the issues and whether these could be given universally or whether it should be given with some specific target asset, these are the issues which need to be discussed. I will not go into that part. Now, the last part in this discussion will be about certain of the controversies and contradictions of the hypertension. One of the most important contradiction is about the ideal target pressure. As I told you, as we have discussed in the beginning, what is the normal pressure and what is the target pressure, there are a lot of difference of opinion and that target pressure and the normal pressure concepts are changing in time to time and really the causes for that change, whether it is purely statistics, unbiased statistics or whether there is a bias of market interest, these are the issues of controversy, I will not go into that part in detail but that fact is true that it is not a pure scientific based issue which has decided that the normal pressure. About the risk prediction, as we have seen earlier, I have given you the data earlier in the beginning, the patients with the hypertension, whether the patient would have a risk or not, predicting like whether a patient with the hypertension would develop a complication or not, it is not possible to predict easily. You may have many patients who have very high blood pressure without any complications, living healthily for quite a long time. And you have plenty of patients who have otherwise normal pressure, who have developed the complications of coronary or maybe cerebral vascular accident and have very miserable life. So this is the, whatever we say as a risk prediction and based upon the statistics, it's always like there is always an error. So statistics I consider always as a, a full paradise. It's a very interesting issue. Statistics is interesting and a very strong base for the evolution of the medicine theory. 
but at the same time there is some grey area, some issues also. One of the usual jokes which I just cracked about the statistics is, suppose a surgery has a 99% risk factor and only 1% success rate and when a patient goes to a surgeon, the surgeon assures the patient that now you are my 100th patient and you have a high chance of survival because 99 patients whom I have treated have died and you are going to survive. What would be the psychological status of the patient? But statistically the other way, so that's the other part. When I say this, I am not <coughs> denying the utility of statistics otherwise. So I, we take to, we have to take the statistics with the, uh, some uh, pinch of salt. Then uh, another important controversy is uh, once the patient is uh, categorized as hyperatic, whether the patient requires the treatment for the whole life or not. There is a lot of confusion issues, difference of opinion. I will try to deal with that with my uh, certain uh, standard uh, input also. Then about the lipid levels and the hypertension relationship, there is again a lot of controversy. Simple raised glucose levels, uh, uh, cholesterol levels or LDL levels and whether they are related to the hypertension or not. That is another of the issues. Then hypertension and short tempered behavior. Person, many times in society it is always considered like persons who have a short tempered condition. They are people suspect like he may have a high blood pressure but whether it is really true or not. Then herbal drugs which have now been used as antioxidants which is very common now. Uh, very popular discussion about the herbal drugs as antioxidants whether they are to be treated, used or not is another controversial issue. Try to deal with the case of next set. As far as the target pressure issues. Uh, we have discussed about the target pressure issues in the beginning. Uh, but when a patient is treated for hypertension, particularly patients who have the other allied complications like diabetes or maybe the renal disorders, if the target blood pressure, if the after the treatment, the blood pressure is uh, reduced to a level below the 60s, diastolic uh, pressure is reduced to a level of below 60 or systolic pressure is reduced to below 130 uh, as such, systolic blood pressure is reduced to 130, the risk of developing the complications remains high or it increases. So as per the statistical analysis, the risks of compli uh, cardiac complications can be reduced only in between a diastolic pressure of 60 to 80 and the systolic pressure of 130 to 140 either raise above or a downwards below or a reduction below this would increase the risk. So you do not have any advantage of over energetic antihypertensive drugs and if these targets for individual is not really made out, many times the treatment itself could be a cause for the complication. This is one of the important controversial point and statistically it is now proved you have that reference in all that i have given the reference those who are interested they may go through these references sources the references are there and the lower bp may raise the death risk which is also known you have plenty of descriptions again in the sources again mentioned that lower blood pressure targets in hypertensive patients with chronic kidney disease may increase the death risk as the study is found and the death rates in 1000 patients the patient years in patients with the following blood pressure ranges like if the blood pressure range is less than 120 and if the blood pressure is in between 120 to 139. If the blood pressure reduces 120 to less than 120, the risk raises by around 80.9 percent as such. That's the issue. Now as far as the current contemporary medicine practitioners, how many of the practitioners are aware of these issues? How many of whom the patients who would have the real target maintenance. This is the issue and uh, from that point of view, the recommendations of hypertreatment guidelines, the 2014 guidelines for adults, the issue is the target is if the age is uh, uh, less than 60 without diabetes, then the diastolic pressure will be maintained at 90 millimeters of mercury in the age of 39. So this is the target which is meant given for the guy, practitioners as such. Whereas the, if the age is above 60, 60 to 74, systolic pressure of 150 to 90 is considered as a safe limit and it can be kept as the goal as such. 
All the adults with diabetes as such, 140 by 90 can be kept as a target. So, whenever you treat with the antihypertensive drugs, these targets have been mentioned and if you over treat, that again could be a risk as such. Now, as far as the practitioners, whether they are aware of that and what is the use as such. Our Indian, from the Indian context, Association, Physicians Association of India had a survey conducted in 2015 and in that survey, uh, the survey was uh, uh, asking these questions to all the practitioners, a uh, large number of practitioners and uh, the, uh, that is again published, the source of publication is here. <coughs> the uh, awareness of the people about the blood pressure or awareness of the doctors, <coughs> so called modern doctors, this is not from medical doctors, modern doctors. Uh, the perception of the standard blood pressure, less than 140 by 90 as the target, 19% of people would keep this target in the practice, 60% would keep 140 by 90 as the standard and 16% would accept one, above, anything above 140 by 90 as the normal blood pressure and uh, the other part is whether the patient has a need for lifetime prescription, lifelong prescription or not. This is absolutely not necessary. Patients do not require a lifelong treatment unless patient has a high risk disease like a coronary disease or a renal disease where the physiology cannot be re-established. There is no need of lifelong treatment. But among the practitioners, family physicians, around 67% of the patients, 67% uh, of the doctors would prescribe, continue to prefer to continue to prescribe a lifelong prescription of that emergency drugs. Cardiologists, 50% of the cardiologists would consider the other way, whereas the other way consider a trial and stopping the treatment, only 33% of the family physicians and 50% of the cardiologists would do that. But the general standard protocol would say like every patient has to be monitored and only when there is a reduction, uh, the blood pressure continues to be high, antihypertensive drugs have to be continued. There is no need of lifelong treatment. It has to be maintained. That's all the issue. You have to maintain the target pressure, whether with the medicines or without medicines. That's the real guideline. But most of the times, this is not practiced. And because of this kind of issues, we need to, we ironic doctors would have more patients and many of the patients end up in ironic practice. Now, another controversial issue is that uh, earlier in the 80s when we were studying, uh, the one of the important criteria to decide whether a patient needs an antihypertensive drug or not, see, because of the essential hypertension, circulatory pressure is more or so on, <coughs> the, uh, our criteria was uh, if the patient has a sign of left ventricular hypertrophy seen under echocardiography or there is atrial dilation, that condition requires a treatment for hypertension, an effective treatment for hypertension. If the patient doesn't have a sign of oh, this um, uh, increased uh, hyper, uh, hypertrophy of the ventricles, if there is no need, uh, evidence of load of the uh, ventricles, that even if the blood pressure is recorded to be high recorded blood pressure, that uh, patient doesn't require the treatment. It was a older guideline up to 2013. But in the revision, uh, in the recent revision, the, this was modified in 2017, this guideline was modified and this guideline was uh, removed. Reasons are not known, but I would consider this still as a standard guideline which need to be followed and which has a more valuable role. But though in the contemporary medicine, this guideline is removed and not maintained as a, a currently existing guideline, it is considered to be obsolete and it is a removed as such. So that is another of the controversial issue. Now, other issues about the lipid levels and the blood pressure. Now, hyper, familial hypercholesterolemia is one of the issues. Cholesterol level being raised due to the dietary factor is one issue. Hypercholesterolemia is another issue. Familial hypercholesterolemia, which can occur in the families, which has a re, these, uh, genetic tendencies, was identified in 2011, where the patient may have the typical xanthomas, the appearance of the thickened tendons presence of the xanthomas around or maybe the corneal arcus, the deposition of the fat around the area. These are the typical presentations of the familial hypercholesterolemia. 
which really require some treatment. The other patients who have a higher cholesterol level, they can manage, they can manage only the dietary advices. Identification of this familiar cholesterolemia is uh, based upon the family history one part and the other symptoms and the physical appearance. If the patients have these physical changes, that's obviously signs of a familiar hypercholesteremia who require treatment. And these familiar hypercholesteremia and cardiovascular mortality, which is quite significant, and the difference in that the trade per 1000 persons is quite high in such patients. And these are the high risk patients where you need to have a treatment as such. Awareness of the hypercholesterolemia among the common men also is increasing now. A lot of people are aware about that both in urban and uh, rural area. People are more bothered about the cholesterol level. Many times they seem to be more better experts than the doctors in that cholesterol level issue as such. Now, this has led to one of the common, uh, I, I would consider this as a, 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 a rather flood of statins, statins prescribed and statin prescription for 1000 popular, uh, patient, uh, population with the coronary heart disease is increasing rapidly and almost every patient would have one or other sort of the statin prescribed as such. So, most of the patients who come to us would be having a statin prescription. Now, when I treat the patients, my prescription is in a patient of hypercholesterolemia, I would prefer Chandra Purba, Arogyadini, Kumariyasa with the significant change in the lipid profile or Viryachanam, GC disease. But diet and exercise are, exercise are supreme conditions. But if the patient has coronary arterial disease prevention, which whether it can, our treatment can prevent this or not, it needs an elaborate study, but cholesterol level can be reduced. Whether it can prevent the complications or not, I am not sure about that. Of course, no other treatment which reduces the cholesterol level also is not confirmatory of preventing the complications. But the another important area where allergic treatment can produce a significant change is the statin prescription adverse effects. The most common adverse effects of the statin is the myopathy, where the patient would have muscle aches and pains which I would consider as, as Amavata and the, uh, my, uh, the, one of the major issues though uh, the contemporary text would mention about the adverse effects and their incidence, the incidence is much more than what they say, what they claim and uh, majority of the patients end up in allergic practice with a satin prescription and the uh, complaints like ache and pain which uh, we may consider as general Vata or neuritis or myositis, etc. Along with that, these statins also can produce psychological conditions like emotional disturbances, depression, aggressiveness, uh, <coughs> and uh, dementia, etc. Other high risks like cancer, diabetes also are the other common complications of the statin acid. Statin induced myopathy is one of the major issues as such. In such conditions, one of the a very dependable treatment is Kaishar Gugulu Mrityanjaya Amitvarista. Majority of the patients of statin induced myopathy who are consuming statin acid, they are misdiagnosed or maybe war diagnosed as vitamin D deficiency. And in the present day situation, you will have particularly patients from the upper class, you would always have a assessment of vitamin D and say that they have a deficiency of vitamin D and they are prescribed with vitamin D acid, which is generally not necessary. So, one of the major areas where allergic treatment can produce a significant change in the outcome would be in the patients who have satin induced myopathy, where the patient would have that risk of uh, symptoms of pain and aches after consuming statins, statins and uh, many of these patients may not be ready to stop the statins and many of these uh, cardiologists prescription would have a sticker say that do not stop that and hence the patient may not stop that treatment. Okay, if the patient wants to continue, let them continue. If you give that treatment of Amavata, which I prescribe usually as Kaishwara Murtinja and Amsvarista, the outcome would be significantly different and the patient would be having a satisfactory course as such. Then another controversy is, is hypertension and personality issues. A elaborate study was done and it has shown that there is a, no such relationship relating to the hypertension as such. Rather, Persons who have a personality tree like urgency, time urgency or a, who have a competitive tendency or hostility, whether they have a risk of hypertension or not, this was studied. 
Though hypertension may not produce the changes, the relationship of the behavior appro approaches were studied and it has shown a moderate change. It is not really directly related to the significant hypertension as such. Then the, whether the patient of hypertension would be having the mood disorders, patients having the mood disorders, like whether it is due to the antihypertensive drugs or whether the patient is having the mood disorders due to the hypertension is another of the controversial. Majority of the patients would have anti uh, these patients of hypertension would have the abnormal uh, moods or mood disorders, which may require some psychiatric treatment. Many times they also would have some psychiatric treatment. That mood disorders are related to the drugs. Calcium tunnel blockers, they have a high risk of developing the mood disorders. AC inhibitors comparatively lesser, but majority of the antihypertensive drugs would produce certain abnormality of the mood and hospital admissions are possible. Then the other important issue is about the antioxidants, as I explained about the list of controversies, antioxidants and hypertension. In the contemporary system, vitamin C, E and acetylcysteine are used as a, the antioxidants, but we have plenty of Ayurvedic drugs which are claimed to be antioxidants and they are now becoming popular and you have a very huge resource about that. Those who are interested, they may go through this book, Antioxidants, Properties of Spices, Herbs and Other Sources, very elaborate book where the many of these drugs and their antioxidant effects are well studied and documented. Uh, I will not go into the detail, but that is one of the future areas where the Ayurvedic treatment can produce a huge change as such. With this, let me conclude. The conclusion carry home points are hypertension is an enigma where still you have many things which are not yet fully understood. But Ayurvedic perception of hypertension needs a consensus. There are a lot of differences of opinion about that. So a uniform opinion has to be there. Lifestyle modification has uh, a valuable role. So of course, there is a typing error. It is a val not valuable role uh, than pharmacological intervention. Ayurvedic treatment protocols can make a significant impact on the clinical output. With this, let me conclude. If there are any questions, we will try to answer. And thank you. And those who are interested, they may give their feedback to this email ID or WhatsApp. If there are any questions, I will try to answer and then conclude in the past. Thank you so much, sir, for an enlightening session as always. We at Kerala have been looking forward for your session. Thank you so much for your patient explanations and an informative and highly relevant session in the present scenario. Okay, thank you. The session is now open for discussion. Participants can put their queries in the chat box or you can unmute, unmute yourself and ask. So one question is there, hmm. have you observed any increase in incidence of hypertension or cardiac diseases after COVID? And then, I am not getting the question completely. Cardiac uh, intervention? Uh, after the, the COVID, uh, after ah, COVID. Of course, about the COVID and hypertension. Of course, lot of controversies are there. Lot of people uh, consider that COVID has resulted in cardiac pathologies, hypertension also. But none of them is proved. But what I have seen is uh, rather in my clinical practice, after the COVID, the incidence of hypertension is increasing. Now, whether it is directly related to the COVID or maybe the social effects of the COVID as such. See, COVID has produced a lot of change in the social setup also, economic status of the patient, lifestyle factors, as so on, so lockdown, and so on. But incidence of the hypertension and hypertension relation to the complications have increased as I have seen in my practice, whether it is directly related to the COVID or not, it is questionable. That kind of a definite proof is not there. Of course, some data is presented in that way, like uh, COVID can result in cardiac complications also, but there is no definite proved uh, data present as such. Right. Mm. Any more questions? Uh, there is a, uh, is it possible, to, there was a question like I couldn't see the question completely. Uh, uh, there is one question like is it possible to stop modern medications and shift to treatment in hypertension? I think I have clarified that issue. 
uh, in my what i do is from the safety point of view if the patient really requires anti hypertension syndrome i will continue that if the patient uh, otherwise that i have given my prescriptions with that a large number of patients can be managed i have already given the prescription according to the symptoms as such uh, that's uh, the prescription i think i have clarified that issue definitely as yes, we can stop the contemporary system, uh, contemporary medicines modern medicines but regular follow up of the patient is required and uh, you have to monitor the pressure then there is another question like how long chandra prabha can be is uh, Uh, how long can we use chandra probati also hypertensive blood i think as far as chandra probati is concerned there is no time limit but how long it depends again the depending upon the patient's condition some of the patients may require a longer treatment some patients may require a, may be sufficient with the shorter treatment there again the guideline is you need to monitor the blood pressure if the blood pressure is under control we can definitely stop the treatment but majority of the patients would show a positive response within 1 to 2 months and my prescription would be if at all or my practice would be if the patient doesn't show satisfactory response with the chandra prabha for about 1 to 2 months then we'll think of the other alternatives other alternatives may be advised to the patient uh, so i will not wait beyond 2 months as such that's the one i would have follow from the safety point then there is another question of sir can we manage coronary artery calcification and uh, arterial block in ayurveda see coronary artery calcification or the block the contemporary the latest issue is about the angiogra- angioplasty or maybe the bypass surgeries now uh, as far as angioplasty and bypass surgeries and their results are concerned there is again a controversial issue of over treatment real use of that would be if the patient otherwise is healthy and a young patient who has uh, developed this uh, uh, coronary blockage but otherwise the muscles are healthy then only that interventional cardiology would be help so even in the modern cardiology there is a lot of controversy about the interventional and non interventional cardiologists now those conditions where the intervention would definitely benefit of course that intervention is the choice i am not saying that it should not be done but it should be judiciously decided that decision would be again quite a a difficult issue uh, many times many times the decision is done by the contemporary cardiologists are not as per the standard protocol that's a different issue i will not go into that part now those conditions which are, do not require any intervention non interventional treatment is enough uh, we can manage the patients provided the blood pressure is maintained properly so many times such patients may require a modern drug to maintain the circulatory pressure in majority of patients because their patients tend to have that hypertensive complications but once that is done rest of the things we can definitely manage cardiac functions can be improved uh, even in such conditions if the patient doesn't have any acute complications like a ventricular block or maybe conduction uh, abnormalities otherwise they can be definitely managed with the lifestyle diet factors as well as our medicines like prabhakar vati chandra prabha etc so it's not it's not that cardiac issues are uh, beyond the scope of beyond the scope of uh, ayurvedic treatment then uh, uh, ventricular enlargement can it be reversed no it's not so once the ventricular hypertrophy occurs it cannot be reversed but ventricular functions will improve so that's another of the questions uh, there is quite true that it's not possible uh, then i have used yogaradik will absolutely true sir no uh, it's absolutely true any other drugs can be used whatever i have pres- uh, suggested is <coughs> my prescription you have plenty of other choices which can be used as so i am not commenting on that part then i have used the uh, any patent medicine that you have found beneficial so again i don't use any patent medicines i use only classical medicines as such so i don't use any patent medicines in my practice as such then also in practice we can see the patient medicine having reserpin like uh, bypassil is it safe to use now as far as the reserpin is concerned reserpin has become now obsolete uh, earlier reserpin was popular but now these days reserpin has become obsolete reserpin is limited to very rare patients where all other central acting antihypertensive drugs either are not tolerated or cannot be prescribed 
because of the adverse effects of the research pen. So research pen is almost outdated. And the other issue is about the sarpaganda. Sarpaganda used in the treatment of hypertension. I do not describe that because Ayurvedic uh, description of the sarpaganda uses in the Visha Chikitsa and uh, the guna properties of the sarpaganda are not really suggestive of a possible use in the hypertension. The Instead, if at all you have to use it, it can be reserpin which could be used. Reserpin as an alkali and sarpaganda as an Ayurvedic drug, they cannot be the same. That's the other part. I think that kind of a controversy would be beyond the limit as such, but basically I would not consider that as equivalent. Then uh, what can be done for uh, associated complaints with some hypertensive medicines like... Uh, so I think I have already told the complications, I have listed those drugs uh, which I would prescribe. Like those patients who have edema, usually that edema is produced due to calcium thenal blockers or AC inhibitors. In that condition, my prescription would be Chandra Prabha Saras Garishta as such. Then yoga or pranayama, yeah, definitely yes, uh, one of the most important issues. Yoga and pranayama have a very significant advantage over the maintenance of the circulatory pressure, uh, mainly prevention of the pressure. Circulatory, uh, this hypertension can be prevented by regular pranayama. Um, and uh, where, how far it reduces, uh, uh, that's still not yet objectively proved. But I have seen uh, pranayama can help a huge, uh, make a produce a huge change in the outcome of the hypertension asset. Uh, that's about. There was another question like, how can we manage sarcoidosis using advocacy? Sarcoidosis is something different. But sarcoidosis I would consider as I say amavata in general because the question is asked. And uh, depending upon whether the patient has a renal involvement or not, we can decide. If the patient has a renal involvement and renal complications are there, a standalone alveolic treatment may not be sufficient. You may need some other supportive treatment. Otherwise, we can manage sarcoidosis as amavata. That's in brief, right? Okay, I, I think almost all the questions are answered. Thank you, sir. Uh, sorry, there were some network issues from my side. That's why I couldn't okay. read the question. Okay. Right. Sorry, sorry so much, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir, sir, for a well-explained okay. Q&A section also. Okay. Fine. Thank you for your detailed explanation covering both modern and Ayurvedic aspects. I'm sure the concept of hypertension is now clear and okay. thorough for all the participants. Thank you for your valuable time and for your very informative session. We are so privileged to have you here with have you with us today, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Right. Thank you, sir. So now we are winding up the session and we will all meet in the next session of Bishak Clinical Series. The date